Hello again, Casabings crew. Welcome to the second video for unit one. Today, we are going to talk about the different methods that psychologists use to research, to study those behaviors and mental processes that we talked about the last time. Remember, psychology is a science. So everything that we talk about for the rest of this unit is just going to prove and to show that psychology is a science. All right, let's look at this PowerPoint. All right, so scientific method. This is just a really quick review because I know most of you have been learning the scientific method since about fifth grade. Every time you take a science class, you learn about the scientific method. So this is just that system that is in place so that we can gather data that is true and accurate. So the steps to our scientific method are here, <clears throat> have a question, form a hypothesis, test your hypothesis, uh, collect the data, and based on the data, draw some conclusions, and then report your uh, results. So here we go into these methods of research, and we are not going to do them all today. There are quite a few. We're going to do the first six today, and then we're going to leave the last two to do in the next video. So the first method of research that we're going to talk about is naturalistic observation. Naturalistic, nature. So this is when we are observing behavior as it naturally occurs. So if we're observing animals, we're observing animals in their natural environment. We don't want to disturb that environment and we don't even want uh, them to know that we're watching them. So that's humans or animals. The biggest advantage to naturalistic observation is that it's real. You get a very realistic picture of how someone behaves when they're behaving in their natural environment. There are a couple of disadvantages though. So one disadvantage is the observer effect. And this is when an animal or a human discovers that they're being observed. And this is going to happen more often with humans because now we know we're being observed. So we want to do it right. We want to be good. We want the observer to think that we're good. So we might now change our behavior and do what we think they want us to do. So that's not real. It's not natural, right? That is a behavior that is being altered. So that's the observer effect. Observer bias. If I am the researcher and I am trying to study um, how gorillas behave in their natural environment, I have an idea already. I have a hypothesis. I have a theory. So I might be so stuck on my theory. I might be so sure that I'm right that I am only going to note or I'm only going to observe what I think is going to prove my hypothesis. So that's observer bias. The last one is that observations from one particular observation may not apply to that person or that animal's behavior all the time. There could be some sore, weird circumstance. Uh, it could have been raining that day, or they could be tired or hungry or not feeling well. So that behavior is only, you know, one snapshot, one moment in time. So it could not be what their average behavior is over time. Um, laboratory observation is our next one, exactly what it sounds like. We're observing in a laboratory. So we're either bringing our animals or our humans into a laboratory setting and we are observing them that way. And it could be that they don't realize that they're being observed via a, a two-way mirror. So the scientist could be in another room just observing through the two-way mirror. So perhaps the subjects don't know that they're being observed or they could just be sitting in the same room so that they can see that they're being observed. Uh, biggest advantage is there's more control over the variables. Remember back in naturalistic observation, I said we could be observing animals and it could be raining that day, so they could be different. If we're in a laboratory, we can control for those kind of things. So you have a lot more control over variables. The biggest disadvantage is it's, it's not natural, so it may not be real 
Okay, that behavior might be different because they are aware that they're being observed or they feel weird or uncomfortable or nervous or scared because they're in a laboratory and they're not in their natural environment. Uh, case studies. Uh, case studies are research that is done on a single person or a very small group, like a family group, but it's a very, very small number of people. And more often than not, case studies are one single individual. And we are looking for a lot of information. We normally study that one single individual for the rest of their lives, for 20 years, for 15 years. We're talking very, very long-term study. And we are trying to get every little bit of data, every little bit of information that we possibly can. Normally, case studies are done for psychological treatment. Um, they're usually done for very rare and very unique cases. So for example, uh, someone could have a, a very unusual, very distinctive injury, and we want to see how that affects that person's behavior for the rest of their lives. Or we want to find out if this particular treatment method helps them for the rest of their lives. So the big advantage is that it does provide a lot of background information, a lot of background information that can help give us information about current behavior. The biggest disadvantages are biases again. So researcher bias can influence the behavior. Normally, uh, subjects that are a part of a case study know that they're a part of a case study. And because it's been done over 10, 15, 20, 25 years, you get to know your researcher. So as the subject, you, you want them to succeed. You want them to do better. So you might change your behavior. So that relationship over time can affect how the results of that case study uh, play out. Um, individual stories cannot be used to explain the general population's behavior. So this is only one person or one family or one small group. We can't use that one person to explain behavior for an entire population of a country or the world. A survey, I, I am sure a lot of you have taken surveys, so you probably know what a survey is. It is used quite often in psychology. So here in the survey, we are just gonna ask questions and we want your feelings, we want opinions, um, we might ask for specific behavior patterns. We are using surveys with a representative random sample. So when we say a representative sample, we want the people that we're asking to take the survey to represent the population that we are studying. So for example, if I want to study how uh, high school females study in preparation for AP exams, I need to make sure that the people that I survey are represented representative of that population. So I need to ask high schoolers and I need to ask females. If I have men taking the survey, that's not going to help me represent my population. And then the random sample is that everyone that is in your representative population, so let's say every female at Sickles High School, Every female at Sickles High School, there's probably about 1,300 of you, every single one of you has the opportunity to be part of my study. So I have to randomly select from that population of 1,300 females at Sickles High School. Uh, you want it to be random because you want to make sure that that data is representative of our entire population. So if I'm looking to see how people study for a final exam, I have to make sure that everybody in, every female in Sickles High School can be part of my study. I don't wanna just pick my AP students because they 
could study completely different than someone who is in an honors class, say, or who was in a regular class, for example. So random just needs to be that everyone has the equal chance of being part of your study. Um, the advantages, you can get a lot of information very quickly. A lot of information very quickly. It's pretty easy to have people answer 5, 10, 15 questions and then just compile your data. Biggest disadvantages. Uh, sample might not represent the population as a whole. If you've ever been at Citrus Park Mall and someone has stopped you and asked you to take a survey, Right. Whatever they, that survey, whatever data they're looking at, just the people at Citrus Park Mall, that might not be representative. How about the people who agree? Okay, They might be, maybe they have time on their hands, but there are so many other people who are really busy and don't have time. So is that representing the, uh, the population as a whole? Courtesy bias. Um, we, we want to make a good impression. If I asked you to do a survey as your teacher, you would be like, oh, I gotta do it because Casabang's asking me to take this survey. So there might be a bit of courtesy bias. There's also a, oh, oh, she's gonna know what I'm gonna answer, so I better answer right. I better answer the way that she wants. Okay, so you might not be exactly truthful because of this courtesy bias. Um, wording effects or question order, the way questions are worded or even what order the questions come in can affect how people answer them. And then the last one is interpretation might be distorted. So again, whoever's interpreting the data or interpreting the answers, particularly if they're short answer type questions and not like multiple choice, but something where someone has to write something out. So how that is interpreted can affect the scores as well. Longitudinal study. A longitudinal study, underline that word long, L-O-N-G, that starts our longitudinal. Um, that's sort of your kind of keyword or your hint there, okay? Longitudinal studies, we are studying the same group of people over an extended period of time. So this could be weeks, months, years, decades even. But we are looking at how something changes over the course of time. So the big advantages here is that it's absolutely necessary for certain kinds of research. For example, if we're looking at um, developmental studies, so how does um, not living in a single parent home uh, affect a child later in life? Okay, so you've got to start studying that child while they're in grade school and then keep studying them until they're an adult. That's, you have to use a longitudinal study when you are asking questions like that. Some disadvantages, it's really expensive. It's very expensive to plan to uh, stay with the same group of people over the course of months, years, decades. It's very expensive. And it's obviously very, very time consuming. So if this is a theory that you have, you may honestly have to wait 10, 15, 20 years before you can really get the data to prove your answer. So it's very time consuming. All right, our last one for today is cross-sectional. Very similar, often confused with longitudinal. So this researcher or type of research takes a look at different age groups in this, at the same moment in time. So different age groups in the same moment of time to see if there are differences over those different age groups. So for example, uh, I want to study how um, studying for tests changes over the course of your entire school career. So I might take a look at a group of first graders, a group of fifth graders, a group of eighth graders, a group of 10th graders, and a group of college students. So I have six different groups and six different age groups but I am studying them all at the same moment in time. So it, on you know, September 1st, 2020, I am going to study all six of these groups and I'm going to see how they study for a test. So advantages to this are 
uh, they're usually representative, okay? They're, the samples are usually representative of the population a, as a whole because we're taking different age groups. So that makes it more representative. Much, much less time consuming and much, much less expensive than our longitudinal studies because it's just one moment in time. Uh, disadvantages. It's not always useful or not always appropriate for uh, particular types of research. So when we're talking about developmental changes over time, looking at one singular moment in time isn't necessarily going to, to help. All right, so these were the six methods of research that we are going to begin with. I am going to stop recording now, but please make sure that you go through and you look at all of these questions and answer them because this is the easiest way for you to practice these different research methods. Alrighty guys, that is it for today. In our next video, we will finish up with the last two research methods. Any guesses on what those last two research methods are? You'll find out in the next video. Make sure that you do finish up your video notes and if you have any questions or concerns, please make sure that you write those down so that you can ask me in class tomorrow. Alrighty guys, I will see you soon. Have a fantastic day.